Isaiah 56. Let's look at those first eight verses again. Isaiah 56, 1 through 8. This is now the word of God. Thus says the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come and my righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and who choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the, na- all the peoples. The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them to those already gathered. Let's pray. Father, you are God and you are good, and we come before you to praise you and exalt you again this evening. We thank you for this privilege. God, what an afternoon it's been for us uh, to sit in our homes and enjoy the rain that falls outside, Lord, uh, to come back and to fellowship with your people, to be able to plan opportunities of ministry like this day now coming up, and Lord, you to gather and to sing together. Uh, to see the smiles on one another's faces and to just rejoice in the redemption that we all enjoy, God, that you have made us a body, you have made us the church, and, and God, we love it. We're just thankful for the privilege. We're thankful to be a part. We're thankful, God, that you've redeemed us and included us. And God, we thank you for the privilege of your word. It's, it's just so important to us. It's just, it is so life to us, Father. We thank you for your spirit who grants us understanding of it. And we ask for that again tonight as we deal with this issue of the Sabbath and what we do with that now as the church and what that means for us now as the church and how we are to handle it and understand it and certainly what it means in light of the second coming and being ready for your return. Lord, we pray that you would speak and make all things clear and help us understand where we stand in this and what you are saying to us and what you expect from us now. Um, even in the New Testament, is a part of this gospel understanding. And I just pray, God, that you make that clear. But more than just knowledge and understanding, we pray, God, that you would apply these truths to our heart. We're so dependent on your Holy Spirit, not only to illumine the Word, but also to rightly divide our hearts. Father, it is true that we, we wouldn't even know our sin if you didn't show it to us. We don't even fully comprehend the areas in our life that still need to be sanctified if you don't help us see them. And so, God, we just cry out to you to show us and guide us and help us. And even as we still contemplate the sanctification that we talked about this morning, Lord, the things you've shown us, continue that work in our hearts and, and guide us, Lord, that we would be the people you've called us to be. We thank you for your word and the agent that you use to wash us and cleanse us and teach us. And, Lord, we pray that tonight, through this understanding of your word, that you bring glory to your name. We love you. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name I pray. Amen. 1 John 2, 28 says, Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. That's really the issue that we're talking about now here in chapter 56, that reality of not shrinking away at his coming. This is what Isaiah has introduced to us. He has told us that salvation is near. The salvation of the Lord is about to come. Righteousness is to be revealed. And as we said this morning, he's not speaking about what we commonly think of as that personal salvation that a sinner understands and receives when they repent of their sin and cry out in faith to Christ. What Isaiah is referring to is the final salvation, the full salvation, the eternal unending salvation of the return of the Lord. 
when the Lord returns and on that moment salvation is complete and Isaiah is calling his people to get ready for that. Because of that, chapter 53, Christ has atoned for sinners. In chapter 54 and 55, he's been calling those sinners to himself. And now in chapter 56, he is asking, are you ready for his coming? Are you ready to stand before the Lord? Are you ready to stand before the Holy One of Israel? Are you ready for that sifting of the wheat and the tares? Are you ready for that separation of the sheep and the goats? Are you ready for him to come to stand before him? In Revelation 14, this is a different picture of the coming judgment of the Lord. John says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap is come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood came out from the winepress up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. That is also the second coming. Two reapings, two gatherings. One, the Lord coming and gathering his wheat into the barn, gathering his people to himself, and the other, him gathering the wicked and throwing them into the winepress of the wrath of God where they will be judged. This second coming of the Lord is a severe and real issue in which he comes to save his people and destroy his enemies. That same image that John saw in Revelation, Isaiah will see as well. A few chapters away, but in Isaiah 63, this is what Isaiah sees. Who is this who comes from Edom? with garments of glowing colors from Basra, this one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Well, why is your apparel red? And your garments like the one who treads in the winepress. I have trodden the wine trough alone. And from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. And their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments. And I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart. And my year of redemption has come. I looked and there was no one to help. And I was astonished that there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me. And my wrath upheld me. I trod down the peoples in my anger. And made them drunk in my wrath. And I poured out their lifeblood on the earth same event when Isaiah is talking in verse 1 about his salvation which is about to come his righteousness which is about to be revealed that's the day he's speaking of the day when the Lord returns for the final and full and total and ultimate salvation of his people that day when his church is taken from this sin infested world redeemed from it delivered from it and the wicked are destroyed and Isaiah continually asks are you ready for that day? And we've been asking since this morning, what does readiness look like? What is the requirement to be ready for that day? And we saw the first point this morning, we saw what we called the stated requirement, where God very specifically tells us what is required to be ready for that day. And he says in verse one, thus says the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness. It really couldn't get any clearer than that. Holiness is required righteousness is required you and I know that in one sense this only comes through the imputed righteousness of Christ through the gospel that we are declared righteous though we are not we are declared righteous in the sight of God by faith in Jesus Christ God imputes his righteousness to us he wraps us in Christ's righteous robe we are declared righteous acceptable able to come to the father welcome to him that righteousness is certainly required but as we talked about this morning it's more than that we moved from a stated requirement to number two. We began this point. We talked about a serious requirement because Isaiah mentions in verse two that there is something which hangs in the balance here. And he speaks of blessing. And this is a link back, a tie back, which we saw this morning to Moses' sermon when he said, I lay before you either the blessing or the curse. There, there's no in between. You either receive the blessing of God, which comes through righteousness, or you receive the curse of God, which comes through iniquity. And Moses, of course, told his people, choose life. Choose life that you may live. 
cling to the blessing. Do that which is pleasing to God. And this is what Isaiah brings to our minds here. He doesn't mention the negative, but he does mention the positive. You need to seek the blessing of God. And that blessing is found on the man, Isaiah says, who does this and the son of man whom he says takes hold of it. We even saw Paul there in that picture, a man who is saved and justified, but who says, I have not yet obtained righteousness, and so I seek it, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. And so as a Christian now, as we seek to be ready for the return of the Lord, it's not just that we have cried out to him in faith, though certainly that is a requirement. It is that we also seek to walk in a sanctified manner. We also are seeking to put away sin and to walk in truth. That's what John said. Everyone who has this hope purifies himself as he is pure. If I really expect that someday I'm going to stand before the Holy One of Heaven, the resurrected, glorified, holy Christ, and I am going to stand before His gaze, certainly that ought to cause me to pursue and seek to be righteous in His sight. Not just with an imputed righteousness, but even a practical one. I, I ought to be striving to put away sin. And we read those two chapters in the New Testament with all the practical commands about forgiving and putting away immorality and, and greed and lust and lying and deception and anger and walking in compassion and truth and, and all of the real basic commands in which we are called to be imitators of God. And that's what Isaiah is talking about. And so we said this morning, that this serious command, if you want to measure it in your life and you say, well, how am I doing? How do I know if I am walking after this righteousness? How do I know if I'm getting myself prepared for the second coming? We talked about it this morning. We said, look at your pursuit. Are you pursuing righteousness? I'm not asking, are you righteous? Because that question is no. You are declared righteous by the Son of God, by faith in Christ. But practically speaking, I'm not asking, are you perfect? I'm not asking, are you righteous? I'm just asking, are you trying to be? Are you content with sin in your life? Or are you striving both to identify it and eradicate it? Is it something you want gone from your life so that you are pursuing righteousness? That is a Christian. We, we don't measure Christians by their level of perfection because, indeed, we come in this thing extremely sinful, and hopefully by the time we come out, we are far more sanctified. But we're at, we're at every possible realm on the spectrum, even in the church, when we look around. We know that. There are some that have barely been saved, and some of you have been Christians for 50, 60, or 70 years. And so you ought to be a lot further down the, the realm of sanctification. Sins that bothered you as a young man should not be bothering you anymore as an old man. Sins that bothered you as a young woman should not be bothering you anymore as an older woman. That over the course of life you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You have put away certain sins and certain temptations. And, and maybe now you're battling a whole new set in life. And that's certainly possible. But... You're pursuing it and gravitating towards it and you're striving for godliness and it's measurable in your life. That's what we're talking about. You know a Christian not by their possession of righteousness but by their pursuit of it. They long to be like Christ. We talked about that this morning. Well, tonight I want to get into the second reality that you will use to measure yourself. And the second thing we want to look at tonight is your priority. Your priority. And tonight, uh, Hannah said at lunch she was happy that she got to stay tonight because she finally got to part two of a sermon. She only ever gets part one. I'm going to disappoint her when she finds out that part two is only one line. So she's not going to make it far tonight. But one line, part two, is your priority. And look at what it says there in the middle of verse two. Isaiah speaks of the man. He is going to inherit a blessing who keeps from profaning the Sabbath. That's the line. And that's a jam-packed statement for us. It perhaps was clearer to Isaiah's people, but certainly it's something that we have to discuss. It's a little bit tricky, and the reason it's tricky for us is because if you're not aware, the Sabbath was yesterday. The Sabbath is Saturday, the last day of the week. We, for as long as I've been born and as long as you've been born, and indeed since the ascension of the Lord... The church has been gathering not on the last day of the week, but the first day of the week. We don't, at least in a time sense, in a day recognition sense, we completely fail to honor the Sabbath. Uh, you can you know, talk like some people do and want to call Sunday the Sabbath and all of that, but you're just stretching there. Because Saturday is the Sabbath. It's the seventh day of the week. Now, there are a few 
what we might call quasi-Christian groups. I kind of put Christian in quotation marks because there's some massive problems, even heretical ones, with their theology. But we have some groups like the Seventh-day Adventists who basically build their entire religion around the aspect that they worship on the seventh day, the Sabbath, and they're going to pull out every Old Testament command, including what we just read in our scripture reading tonight about the importance of the Sabbath. And they're going to say, see, to please God, you've got to worship on Saturday. That's the Sabbath. That's the day. They'll throw in some dietary restriction stuff and things like that. Uh, we've seen, I know Daniel and I have talked about it and encountered it quite a bit, actually, but this movement called the Hebrew Roots Movement that does essentially the same thing that runs back to the Old Testament calendar and the Old Testament feast and the Old Testament week. And they go back to the Sabbath restrictions and things of those natures. But we don't. Uh, if I ask for, you know, people to stand up and share, what did you do yesterday? None of you went to a church service yesterday, I'm guessing. Maybe you went to a funeral and that would have been the closest thing possible. But I watched three football games yesterday or announced three football games. So I, far from worship, unless you're worshiping football, and then we've got a whole other problem. But We didn't meet yesterday. And clearly, Isaiah makes the statement that the person who is blessed, the person who is prepared for the return of the Lord, the person who is readying themselves for salvation, is the person who keeps from profaning the Sabbath. Well, we have to do a little work. What do we do with this? So I'm going to get to Isaiah's point in a minute. But I think first, because it's just one of those foreign aspects and because it always needs explanation, I just want to deal a minute with this issue of Sabbath. And if you're not familiar with it and you've always wondered and never really known what it means and what we do with it, well, I think it's important to, to sort of understand that. And we're going to get around to Isaiah's point in a minute, but let's talk about Sabbath for a second. And so to do that, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 12. And we're going we're gonna to flip a little bit more tonight. But that's okay. Your Sunday night's strong. You can do it. Matthew chapter 12. And, and of course, if you've read through the gospel accounts, sometimes it reads as though Jesus doesn't do anything if it's not on the Sabbath. Healing or preaching or restoring or anything. I mean, he, he's constantly doing something on the Sabbath to sort of poke the finger in the eye of the Pharisee. But the one we're going to look at here, I think, is very fitting, is in Matthew chapter 12. And we're not going to dwell on any of these long, but I just want to give you a basic understanding and hopefully an explanation as to why we do what we do or maybe why we don't do what they do. Matthew chapter 12 says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. Now, if you want to understand what's going on there... It's because the Pharisees had so restricted the Sabbath laws, almost anything and almost everything could be considered work. That was the issue. Don't work on the Sabbath. Then the question became, well, what is work? And the Pharisees had taken it upon themselves to define what was work. And so you have these disciples well within the, raw, the law right, well within the rights of the Jewish law. They're walking through this field, and as they walk through, they grab a head of grain, a wheat, and they snap off the top, and you put it in your hand, and they rub it in their hand, and they blow away the chaff, and they throw the grain in their mouth, and crunch, 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 and they're having themselves a little snack as they walk through the field. The Pharisees looked at this and said, that is a violation of the law. Why? Because when you snap the head of that grain off, they said, that's harvesting. And when you rub it in your hands, that's threshing. And when you blow away the chaff, that's winnowing. And you are three times guilty of breaking the law. That's what they say. And so Jesus answers them in verse 3. He said to them, have you not read, which is always Jesus' dig against the religious elite, have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God, and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priest alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not a sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath." Now, if we want to shoot a hole in what the Pharisees are doing, the most obvious one is the absolute lunacy of their accusation. Any farmer knows that snapping off a head of grain, rubbing it in your hand and blowing that away is a far cry from harvesting, threshing, and winnowing, right? Even with modern equipment, it's a lot more work than that. 
This is not harvesting. This is not threshing. This is not winnowing. This is a guy snacking, and the Bible did not forbid that. That's totally different. So there's a lunacy in what they say. But Jesus doesn't even address their lunacy. He addresses a deeper point. He talks about the Sabbath specifically. And most specifically, he talks about what the Sabbath law did not intend. And Jesus starts out by saying, look, the Sabbath law was never meant to keep from or to prohibit deeds of necessity. How do you know that? Because David, when he was hungry, he and his companions entered the house of God and ate consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, no for those with him. It was only for the priests alone, but David went in and ate it. And why was that okay? Because David was starving. And God understood that Sabbath requirements, law requirements, were not meant to prohibit deeds of necessity. That just wasn't what it was there for. And Jesus uses an example to show that. Secondly, Jesus said that the Sabbath law clearly did not prohibit deeds of worship. For example, in verse 5, do you know who works harder than anybody on the Sabbath? The priests. On the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent. I mean, they do back-breaking, brow-sweating work. I don't know if you've ever uh, butchered an animal, but try butchering several animals and, and doing it by hand. It, we're not talking about easy labor here. These guys were working. I mean, they are, they are killing animals. They are skinning animals. They are cutting animals up. They are offering on the altar as a sacrifice. It's labor, and yet... They're not guilty. And so the Sabbath did not restrict deeds of worship. And finally, my favorite is that Sabbath law does not restrict the Lord of the Sabbath from doing whatever he pleases. And that's what Jesus says. I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, I can do whatever I like, whatever I please. And if you'll keep on reading, Jesus sort of doubles down because in verse 9, departing from there, he goes right in the synagogue and there's a man with a withered hand and Jesus heals him right there on the Sabbath and says in verse 12, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And without getting into much detail there, I simply show you that story to point out to you that it is a very real thing that even religious groups miss the point completely on the Sabbath. It was happening in Jesus' day. It happens in our day. They didn't understand at all what it was like. This Sabbath that they had sort of constructed in their mind these rules were so absurd and so anti what they were intended to be that Jesus basically says I'm not even going to participate in your nonsense it would be almost like someone saying let's go to church and you go to a building where they are having a church service but you go in there and there's no songs of worship and there's no preaching of the word there is no prayer there's no worship whatsoever it's something else that is not at all what the bible calls worship and the question is how long are you going to keep going you're like well i'm not because they call it church but it's not church well that's what you have here you have people that call it a Sabbath reverence, but it's not a Sabbath reverence because they clearly don't understand at all the purpose of the Sabbath. Well, what is the purpose of the Sabbath? Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4. The Sabbath, like every other thing in the Old Testament, is a prophetic picture. I don't know why that some can see that sacrificing goats and sheep has passed away because Jesus has fulfilled it. I don't know why they can see the fulfillment of Jesus in all the Old Testament feasts that we no longer have to participate in. For example, the Passover, which Jesus said, the next time you do this, do it in remembrance of me, not Egypt. I, they can see that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of, of feasts and festivals and sacrifices, and yet for some reason they can't get it through their head that Jesus is also the fulfillment of the Sabbath, which is what Hebrews 4 will show you. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. We're talking about rest. God rested on the seventh day. This is all going to be linked to Sabbath. And he says, Be afraid in case you come short of it. You, you ought to have a fear. I like the word fear there. It's phobos. It's where we get our word for phobia. You ought to have, you know, misrestophobia. I just made that word up. You ought to have that. 
that you're going to fall short of entering God's rest. What does that mean? Verse 2, indeed, we've had good news preached to us just as they also, and the they he's referring to is the children of Israel in the wilderness who did not enter the land of rest. They didn't enter the promise. God killed them in the wilderness. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, be careful. Look, they heard the word too, but it didn't profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. In other words, they heard the preaching of God. They just didn't believe it. And because they didn't believe it, they did not enter God's rest. And you need to be careful that the same thing doesn't happen to you. For we who have believed, verse 3, enter that rest. So a simple statement now, how do you enter God's rest? faith we who have believed enter that rest just as he has said as i swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest although his works were finished from the foundation of the world for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day and god rested on the seventh day from all his works and then again in this passage and by the way this passage he's quoting is psalm 95 they shall not enter my rest therefore since it remains for some to enter, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day, today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Now, I know the writer of Hebrews, while he's incredibly deep, can sometimes spin you around backwards and flip you inside out. He's kind of tough to follow it sometimes. But here's what the writer of Hebrews is doing. He is telling you the story of the children of Israel who came out of Egypt and they were walking along in the wilderness and all was going well, but they offended God and God said, I've had it with these people. Remember, it was the water of Meribah and Massa. They grumbled against the Lord and the Lord said, these people will not enter my rest. In other words, they're not going to make it into the land of promise. That was the picture of rest. The promised land was the physical prophetic picture of God's rest and they're not going to get to go in. And all that generation, you remember 40 years old and upward, they died in the wilderness. They never got to go in. Now, you fast forward 500 years and David writes a psalm. And in Psalm 95, David, preaching to his congregation, says, Today, don't let anybody here today fail to enter God's rest. And what the writer of Hebrews says is, If Joshua gave them rest, meaning when Joshua led them into the promised land, then what is David talking about? Because they're already in the land when David is preaching. And David is clearly talking about entering God's rest or not entering God's rest. And they're already in the land. Clearly then, the rest of God is not just being in the land. Clearly, it's more than that. Clearly, entering God's rest, his Sabbath rest, is an ongoing reality for God's people. It was something that was before them in the days of Moses, which they failed to obtain. It was something that was before them in the days of David, which he was encouraging his people to grab. And the writer of Hebrews says to us in verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Even today, there is a rest that you will either enter or fail to enter. Okay, And we're talking about a Sabbath rest. It will either be yours or it will not be yours, even today. And here's what it is, verse 10. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from what? His works, as God did from his. And verse 10, if you're thinking through the gospel ought to automatically explain to you exactly what Sabbath rest was a prophetic picture of. It is a picture of the moment you placed your faith in Christ and you realized, I no longer have to work to please God. I have been made pleasing to God through the work of Christ, and now he's done the work, and I what? Rest. One day a week? No. No. I rest continually. I rest every day. 
moment by moment, is Leo saying. I rest in his love. I rest in his finished work. I rest in what he accomplished. My works are done. You remember the invitation of Jesus in Matthew 11? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden. That is those of you who have worked your fingers to the bone trying to make yourself pleasing to God and you're exhausted. Come to me, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Sabbath rest we enjoy, are you ready? is the exact same kind of rest God enjoyed at creation. And that's exactly what the writer of Hebrews enters or likens it to. He says it says somewhere, he says in verse 4, that God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, I ask you, why did God rest on the seventh day? Because he was finished. It is good. It did not need to be tweaked. It did not need to be renovated. It could not be improved. There was nothing left to be done. He was finished. And so he rested. And we rest now in the work of the Savior, who on the cross, oddly enough, said, finished. It is finished. There's no more work to be done. And when a Christian trusts in Christ, we enter rest by believing. When a Christian trusts in Christ, we rest in his finished work, and we no longer see the need to work for what Christ has already provided. That is the ongoing Sabbath rest which we enjoy, not just one day a week, but every day of the week. And if you're in a denomination that says that Saturday is the only day you rest in the Lord, you got problems. I don't know what you're going to do the other six days of the week. We rest continually in the finished work of Christ. What the Sabbath was meant to point to is the work of Jesus and the rest of salvation. That's what it was pointing to. It has now been fulfilled in Christ. The Pharisees, and so many today, totally misunderstood that. And by the way, the apostles even preached on it. Listen to Colossians 2. Paul tells this Gentile church, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize. That prize, by the way, would be hope. It would be assurance. It would be knowing you're a child of God. And these legalistic religious people steal that from you because they keep telling you you're not doing enough and they fill you with anxiety and spiritual unrest. And Paul says, don't let anybody defraud you of that prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking a stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments grows with the growth which is from God if you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. In other words, when someone walks through and says, well, y'all all do something else on Saturday, but I, in order to please the Lord, I worship on Saturday. Paul says, I know that looks good. It, it appears to be very wisdom oriented. It appears to be very devoted, but you know what? It's nothing. It's nothing. Okay, you did without bacon. Great. It looks really devout on your part, but it's of no value whatsoever. Paul told the Colossians not to let anyone be their judge regarding ritualistic traditions, including a Sabbath day. Listen to what Paul said to the Romans in Romans 14. One person regards one day above another. That's true. Some people do. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and of the living. And what Paul did was just totally eradicate the essential nature of any of that external religion. Now, is it a sin to go to church on Saturday? 
No. And so if you want to worship on Saturday, have at it. It's not a sin to go to church on Sunday either. It's not a sin to worship in then. Is it a sin to eat bacon? No. Is it a sin to not eat bacon? Maybe. I'm just kidding. No, it's not. It's, it's not a sin to not eat bacon, right? So if you run across someone that says, you know what, I just, I just don't eat bacon. Okay, fine, whatever. I'm not, I don't even care about fighting you on that. But, but don't miss the grander point. Are you or are you not doing this for the Lord? Are you or are you not doing this in faith? Because whatever's not from faith is sin. So if you're worshiping on Saturday and you're not eating bacon, but you love Christ and you're trusting in his finished work, have at it. I don't care. But if you love Christ and you're trusting in his finished work and you eat bacon sandwiches after church on Sunday, have at it then too. I don't care. And that's Paul's point. You're missing the whole point of what the Sabbath actually was. Now, I just give you that to maybe set your mind a little bit at ease when you read these statements in Isaiah about honoring the Sabbath and you want to know, am I profaning the Sabbath? And the answer is only if you're not trusting in Christ. If you're not trusting in Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul, then yes, you are profaning the Sabbath every moment of every day. But if you are trusting in Christ and his finished work and you are resting in what he did and not counting on what you did, then no, you are not profaning the Sabbath. So I just want to give you that answer. But that really is not the chief issue of what Isaiah is talking about. I just felt like we needed to talk about that to make sure we understand it. There's a different point being made by Isaiah. And one that is very vital to our understanding of what it means to be ready for the return of Christ. So let's go back to what Isaiah says. He says, how blessed is the man who keeps from profaning the Sabbath. That's what he's saying. If you want blessing, keep from profaning the Sabbath. Now, we are keeping the Sabbath. We're keeping it through Christ. And we also strive not to profane it even though we keep it through Christ. And Isaiah says, don't profane the Sabbath. So once again, that blessing or that curse is uniquely tied to how the man addresses the Sabbath. And the question I would ask you is, what is the issue in play here? And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, and then I'm going to show you. The issue in play is very simply the issue of priority. Priority. And it's going to become clear, actually, as we make our way further down these eight verses in the coming, coming services. But look down at verse 3 where God says that the foreigner who's joined himself to the Lord and the eunuch who has joined himself to the Lord should not be anxious about the return of the Lord. You know, when the Lord returns, the foreigner's like, great, when Jesus returns, he's going to kick me out. No, he's not. The eunuch says, when Jesus returns, whoop de doo I'm not going to have any lineage anyway. And he says, oh, yes, you will. But notice he gives conditions even to the eunuch and even to the foreigner if they want the blessing of God's people. And look at what he says in verse 4 about the eunuch. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs, what? Who keep my Sabbaths. What do you mean? Well, keep reading. They choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. And there you find out when you're talking about the eunuchs that the issue of keeping my Sabbath is somehow also linked to faithfulness, to priority, to devotion. It's all bound up in one. That's what the Lord is saying. Notice what he says also to the foreigner down in verse 6. Also the foreigner who joined themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. There again, he's talking about Sabbath keeping in the realm of devotion and priority and faithfulness. And this is part of understanding Sabbath. On one hand, we trust Christ so much that we rest from our works and we rejoice in what he did. That's part of honoring the Sabbath. Another part is we love Christ so much that we rest from our pursuit of the world that we might honor and glorify and worship him. And that's part of the Sabbath too. That we see a Christ whom we love and adore and worship of him and fellowship with him and service of him and devotion to him, and faithfulness with him, that is more important than devotion and faithfulness and service and love of the world. And that is a competing argument that has been going on since the days of the garden up until now where we fight this struggle about how much do we love the world, how much do we love Christ, and they want to collide with one another. 
And part of Sabbath understanding and not profaning it is bound up in the understanding of priority. It's bound up in the understanding that we rest not only from our spiritual works, but we rest from our physical works. We do this in order to show priority to Christ. Now, I show it to you a little in chapter 56. Let me show you where it's really going to become clear. Uh, flip over to chapter 58 for a moment. 58. These verses may come up on the board, but it'd be better if you see them in your Bible. 58, you remember, it's that famous chapter where they're upset because they feel like they've done so much for the Lord and the Lord hadn't reciprocated like he should have. But look down at chapter 58, verse 3. Why have we fasted and you do not see? Boy, there's a question. God, we went without lunch and you didn't do anything. Why have we humbled ourselves and you did not notice? I mean, that's their questions. God, um, I think we went over and above the requirement and we feel like that you have not compensated us properly for what we did. Um, I could have had enchiladas and I did not. And I feel like I should have been rewarded for that. Well, God answers halfway through verse three. He says, well, behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife and to strive with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this, which I choose a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? And so when they come to the Lord and say, look, we fasted and you didn't see, God says, fasted nothing. You skipped the meal not to worship me. You skipped the meal because you were behind at the office and you used that hour to catch up on work. That had nothing to do with me. You fasted to drive hard all your workers. You made not only yourself skip lunch, but you made your entire crew skip lunch so that you could catch up on the job site. Don't come trying to claim that as a fast where I should now bless you because all you were doing was pursuing the world even more. That's what he says. Beyond that, God says, do you really think that a day to humble yourself is going to cut it? Do you really suppose that you can walk in pride and arrogance and lust for the world six days a week, come in on Sunday, humble yourself, and we're going to be cool? You really think that's what I'm after? And you get, you get implications here from the Lord that fasting and Sabbath and all of that is always intended to be more than a one-day thing. Well, God then goes into an explanation in verse 7. Look at it. God says, let me tell you about the fast I want. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? What's he talking about there? Forsaking the world for the sake of brotherly love, right? Instead of trying to obtain more bread, you're, you're splitting your bread. Instead of trying to maintain some sort of luxury, you're welcoming the poor. Instead of trying to maintain extra clothes, you're giving away your clothes. You're, you're serving the Lord instead of trying to obtain the world. That's what he's talking about. Verse 8, then if you'll do that, then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you. The glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. You really want the blessing of God, then start forsaking the world. That's what he's saying. Serve me, worship me, love your brother. That's what I want. And then the chapter concludes with a great explanation. And this is where we get really clarification on this Sabbath thing. Verse 13. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And what was God saying? You really want a Sabbath for me, then make it a Sabbath. Make it a day when it's not about you, but it's a day about me. Make it a day when you are delighted in me. Make it a day when you desist from your own stuff and you seek my stuff. Make it a day when you seek my pleasure Make it a day when you seek my word. Make it a day of worship. Incidentally, you have Paul who gives a similar rebuke to the Corinthians. Do you remember the Corinthians gathering to worship and Paul said, I'm not going to praise you in this because you gather to take the Lord's Supper. But what was the problem? Instead of taking the Lord's Supper, you show up early and one person drinks all the wine and another person eats all the bread and you glutton yourself and half of you are drunk and the poor come in. There's nothing left for them to eat. That's like when you have a potluck, and, and let's say Rebecca, I like to pick on Rebecca, one of my favorite people to pick on, actually, and Rebecca makes a pot roast, 
And she shows up on Sunday morning with this pot roast and she sets it on the counter and we go off to Sunday school. But Rebecca, you know, very uh, sanctimoniously has been looking over the, the line of food and she realizes that nobody brought anything in here as good as my pot roast. Um, let's just be honest, okay? It's better than anything anybody else brought. So she goes to Sunday school and she comes into worship. But as I'm preaching, she nudges Max and she's like, act like you need to go to the bathroom. And so with about 15 minutes left in worship, Rebecca nudges Max. They jump up, head out the back door. And you know what they did? They went down there and ate the darn roast before anybody else got here. And they didn't even care about people like Derek who hadn't had roast in so long, right? I don't know if he has or he hasn't, right? But he's skinny. He looks like he could eat a roast. He hadn't had one in so long. They just don't care anymore about him. It's, I want the roast for my... Well, that's what the Corinthians are doing. And here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another's drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Rebecca, if you want to eat the roast, keep it at your house. Do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. Now, do you see the correlation to the same thing that Isaiah is saying in chapter 58? You're doing the same thing. You're calling it worship, but all it is is selfishness. You did it in the fellowship hall instead of your own kitchen, but you don't get any points for that, God says. That's not honoring the Sabbath. That's profaning the Sabbath. Let me give you another example. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 17. I think this is the last one you have to turn to. Unless I'm accidentally lying. I think this is it. Jeremiah 17. Look at verse 19. Jeremiah 17, verse 19. Thus the Lord said to me, Go and stand in the public gate through which the kings of Judah come in and go out, as well as in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say to them, Listen to the word of the Lord, kings of Judah, and all Judah, and all inhabitants of Jerusalem who come in through these gates. So once again, Jeremiah has planted himself at the outside door of the church and he's catching people before they come in. Thus says the Lord, take heed for yourselves and do not carry any load on the Sabbath day or bring anything in through the gates of Jerusalem. You shall not bring a load out of your houses on the Sabbath day nor do any work, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your forefathers. Yet they did not listen or incline their ears, but stiffen their necks in order not to listen or take correction. But it will come about if you listen attentively to me, declares the Lord, to bring no load in through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but to keep the Sabbath day holy by doing no work on it. Then there will come in through the gates of this city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city will be inhabited forever. They will come in from the cities of Judah and from the environs of Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, from the lowland, from the hill country, from the Negev, bringing burnt offerings, sacrifices, grain offerings, and incense, and bringing sacrifices of thanksgiving to the house of the Lord. In other words, if you get the Sabbath right, Jerusalem's going to become a hopping place. But if you do not listen to me to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying a load and coming in through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I'll kindle a fire in its gates and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem and not be quenched. You want to guess which one happened? Jerusalem was burned by Nebuchadnezzar. You say, what do you mean? Jeremiah said, quit bringing your load in on the Sabbath day. What? Our load? Listen to Amos. Hear this, you who trample the needy, to do away with the humble of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, that we may open the wheat market, to make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger, and to cheat with dishonest scales, so as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals, and that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. Now, what were they saying in Amos' day? They're just watching their clock. Man, the Sabbath's nearly over. As soon as it's over, bing, and now let's start selling. They just couldn't wait for it to end so they could immediately start selling their grain again. So what were they doing in Jeremiah's day? Well, we can't sell on the Sabbath, but everybody's been to a flea market, right? My parents, there's a place in Canton. When I grew up in Canton pretty much at the flea market. There's a place in Canton called the Unreserved. And the Unreserved, you ought to participate in it once in your life if you want to know what the Oklahoma land rush was like. They show up a week before Canton opens, a Tuesday before, and you go get in line, which we, that's where we learned to buy an old car, an old beat up travel trailer or something. And you drive it down to Canton and you park that thing in line, get there as quick as you can, because on Tuesday morning, they open the gate and man, they go flying in and my mom would throw lawn chairs and, and, you know, tables and everything else and try to secure the spot you wanted. And the reason it was so important to get a certain spot is because at Canton, people are like sheep and they naturally flow like a river. And so there are certain 
certain roads at Canton where people just naturally blindly walk down, right? They don't even know what they're looking for or where they're going. They just walk down this road because everybody else is walking down the road. And they naturally turn here and they naturally go this way and they filter right through this little low water crossing and they make their way over to the pavilions. And you learn the difference between a bad weekend and a great weekend is which spot of ground you get to set your tent up on. You don't want to get stuck way back up there on the hill. You don't want to get stuck way back over there in the boonies. You want to be on that main drag where all the people are coming. And tell you that my sister and I used to go up on the hill and buy like $100 worth of gloves from a guy, walk down to our booth, double the price, and sell out every morning. I mean, that's what we did because we had the traffic. That's what we would do. And then we would go blow our money on some stupid junk trinket at Canton. That was just a monthly thing for us. But th that mattered. Now, these people in the Sabbath, they're like, all right. If I leave all my goods that I plan on selling at home, when the Sabbath's over and I go home and get them and get back, I'm not going to get the prime location to sell in the temple market. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pack all my stuff with me and I'm going to bring my flatbed trailer right to church, right? So the second the preacher says, amen, pa-ching, I'm going to fling it open and there's all my scarfs and bracelets and hair combs and mirrors and I'm going to catch you the second you get outside the door and sell you all my wares. And what you're seeing then was an attitude of this, that the Sabbath is a nuisance. The Sabbath is in the way. Everything I want to do and accomplish in life, but this Sabbath is messing it all up. And if I could get rid of that, then I could get on with life and do what I want to do. We've already seen that attitude in the beginning of Isaiah chapter 1. When God looked at them and said, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. God was looking at the hearts of a people who were there and didn't want to be. So what? You've come. You're keeping the Sabbath, but you are profaning it. Do you understand what we're talking about now and what Isaiah is dealing with? He's talking about the issue of priority, devotion, faithfulness. And you and I both know this is relevant today, and I, I can just brag on you because you're a Sunday night crowd and you're here. And that, by the way, makes you a rarity in America. Because not only do not many go to Sunday night church anymore, there's a lot of churches that don't even offer it anymore because it just wasn't worth it because not enough people came, and yet here you are. So now humble yourself now that I've bragged on you. You'll have to repent of pride. But you're a minority just for being here. Daniel and I were talking about it this week. We both saw the same ad, church ad on Twitter. This preacher gets up and says they're going to move their service and start a Thursday night worship service. Now, hey, I'm all for Thursday night worship. That's great. Well, we can do it every night worship if you want to come. We'll, we'll do that. That's all right. Until he went to explaining why. And his reasoning as to why they were offering Thursday night worship is because he understood people were now just too busy on Sundays. And one of the reasons he gave was travel ball. Too many kids are playing travel ball. I know that. You're busy with travel ball and you're traveling around and you're playing baseball or soccer or whatever, basketball, whatever travel ball you're in. And so because those tournaments last on the weekends, you can't make it to church. And so we're going to move church to Thursday. Well, that's, that's where he lost me. Because my question is, where's the priority? Where is the man who will put aside the world in order to participate in worship? That's really what we're talking about. And look, I know and you know, you can move your worship to Thursday and that won't fix a thing. Why? Because the world will just plan Thursdays. Well, I can't come Thursday. We've got junior high football, JV football. That's actually the only night for our family me time, and that's important to us. Um, the coach scheduled a practice that night. Um, that's the night I do yoga, you know, water aerobics, gymnastics, and whatever else it may be. Moving the date doesn't change a thing. The simple point is you're either committed to worship the Lord or you're not. And I don't think God is being stringent when he says one day out of seven. I don't, I don't think this is over the top. I don't think this is an unrealistic expectation to say, give me the day. We have in many cases turned it into the Lord's half day, and there are many that don't even want to do that. I'll never forget when another church I'm aware of, they, they said, well, what we're going to do in church on Sunday mornings is we're going to swap worship in Sunday school. 
Look, there's no command in the Bible that Sunday school has to come before worship. So I don't care about your schedule when you do that. But their reasoning was, we're going to swap the two so that people that need to skip Sunday school can get to Lubbock and back on a Sunday, you know. I'm like, okay, now I'm opposed to it, right? If, that, if that's the reason why we're doing it, then I say I want to move worship till 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I just want to blow a hole right in the middle of your whole Sunday uh, to keep you here. I mean, obviously we don't do that. But you understand the point. At what point is there commitment? Now, used to, we saw it different. We had the blue laws, you know, and nobody was open on Sunday. But then what you had was people who came to church because there wasn't nothing better to do. But they didn't want to be here and they wished there was something to do. And if there was something to do, they'd be doing that. Um, I got on Facebook this afternoon. I always look to see if our service recorded and if it posted on Facebook. And, and I, was, I was overwhelmed by, I didn't even know this, but today was opening day for dove season. Is that right? Was it dove season today? Yeah, okay. Opening day for dove season. And all the pictures of, oh, love, opening day for dove season. All these people in camp. I went to the grocery store to buy ice cream because Hannah made me apple pies for lunch. She's a good daughter. She made apple pie. I went to get, and there's all the people in camo that have come in from dove hunting and, you know, and the point is, when, when is it the Lord's day? And I'm not opposed to you dove hunting. I'm not opposed to you doing some things. We're just talking about the issue of priority. And this is what Isaiah is talking about. Do you really want to consider yourself ready for the return of the Lord? But you won't make worship a priority now? Can I ask you what you think it's going to be like when he gets here? I mean, what are you planning that the Lord's going to return to the earth, set up his throne in Jerusalem and rule the world, and you're just not going to go? Just not going to participate? Um, I hate to burst your bubble, but if you think worship is long now, <laughs> wait till then. What do you think heaven's going to be like? Vegas? You're either going to delight in the worship of God with the saints or you won't. And where your heart rests is incredibly telling as to whether or not you're ready for the return of the Lord. The early church was selling their possessions so they could meet together and worship. That's all they wanted. You, you know how it worked. That for for uh, Pentecost, all the men were commanded to come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. And they show up and 5,000 of them get saved. And at that moment, that's the only church in the world is in Jerusalem. And they don't want to go home. We found something here. We've been saved. We've been filled with the Holy Spirit. The apostles are here. They're preaching every day. We're hearing the gospel for the first time. They're walking us through the Old Testament. And our eyes are being opened to the true message of God and the story of Christ. And I don't have that at home. There, there is no church at home. This is the only one. And so they want to stay. The problem is they packed enough money to be there for a week, not six months. And so what has to happen? They start selling property. Stay. You can stay with me. I'll feed you. Barnabas is selling property. Ananias and Sapphira are selling part of the property. But they're, I mean, they're selling it left and right, right? So that people can stay and worship. Why? Because it was a priority. This is important. It's a far cry from today where when the church wants to schedule anything, they have to bend over backwards to work around every possible ongoing thing, every possible thing that might be planned in that day and still be contingent in case we have to move it because, I don't know, three-year-old tumbling comes in or something. I don't know, preacher, my ox is in a ditch, I got it. That's true. Sometimes it is, and the Lord makes provision for that. But I do think it would do us good to identify what is actually an ox and what is actually a ditch. My ox in the ditch is not equivalent to my football team is playing tonight. My ox is in a ditch is not equivalent to my kids have a ball game. My ox is in a ditch is not equivalent to I need some me time. My ox in a ditch is not equivalent to I needed groceries or I wanted family time or I was just tired or whatever it may be. You wouldn't try those excuses on your boss. You wouldn't tell your boss, not coming in today, Cowboys are playing football. Not coming in today, I just needed some me time. You don't do that because you understand the priority of earning a living. We understand the priority of worship. You get it. And this is just a simple point from Isaiah. Are, are you really in your heart want to be ready for the return of the Lord? Then pursue righteousness and make worship of the Lord a priority in your life. It's not rocket science. This is part of it. And that's what Isaiah says. You want the blessing? 
then take hold of righteousness and make worship of the Lord a priority. That's how you're going to prepare your heart for his coming. I mean, I, I for one think when Jesus returns, it's going to be on a Sunday night. I mean, not like he doesn't know, but that's when I would do it, which probably means he won't, but that's when I would do it. Because you want him to find you here. So if you want to be ready, check your pursuits. Make sure you're pursuing righteousness and check your priorities and make sure that's worship in the glory of God. Does not mean you cannot enjoy things out there. We all do. I do. You do. The Lord made everything good for you to enjoy. That's great. But don't, don't get it out of balance. Don't get it out of whack. Make a priority. That's part of being prepared for the salvation that is to come. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your subtle and gentle reminders, Lord. You matter. And let's be honest, you matter more than anything. And we don't always treat you like you do. For that, we are sorry and we repent and we humble ourselves and ask for your forgiveness. Lord, we know nothing matters like you matter. We want to serve you and love you and prioritize you and worship you. You deserve that. You've earned that. And so, Lord God, forgive us when we get allured by the world. Forgive us when we get distracted. Forgive us when we put other things above you. We know that's idolatry and it's not allowed. And Lord God, just let us be a people who pursue righteousness and a people who make worship a priority. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your goodness and patience with us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.